Hopefully you can see everything working. I love it when the technology comes together. Thank you so much for having me. I would much rather be with all of you, given the fact that I'm broadcasting, shall we say, live from my basement. But it is indeed a privilege to be invited by all of you to speak. The award-winning and global influential work being done by your school and by the Aging Center, the faculty, the students, the researchers, makes it a privilege to be here. By the way, my congratulations to the awardees. Many of you are doing great research and others of you have my incredible respect as you should from all of us because you're doing the work that we academics quite often talk about. So for the next few minutes, I wanna engage all of you, shall we say, on a new journey, if you will, of how aging, longevity is changing. I want you to think about how old age making old age into a problem rather than an opportunity, but is one that desperately needs to be changed. So as you heard, I've got the book, The Longevity Economy, but one of the things I also want you to think about is following me on Twitter, longevityeconomy.com and the like. But before I get going, I wanna make sure that I give credit where credit is due. My team at the Age Lab, Everything that I will present to you today and the things that I write are inspired by an amazing group of people of students, researchers, and faculty. So I promise that we're gonna be talking about stories and that's gonna be a theme for the next few minutes. But let me begin with a story that helped inspire me to start the Age Lab. Many of you in aging already know this story. It's about a woman named Sarah Noss and she was from Pennsylvania. And I want you to imagine this. She uh, had celebrated her 119th birthday. Pretty good. But can you imagine the following? A journalist had the profound, the only way I can think of it, chutzpah to ask her, Ms. Noss, why do you enjoy living so long? And she came back with an answer, far better than any academic or pundit or policymaker or medical professional. She said, I enjoy my longer life because I have my health and I can do things. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the new endless frontier of science, physical, biological, and social sciences. In the service, if you will, of an endless frontier of not just knowledge for knowledge's sake, but imagining a frontier where we can live longer and better. And that is the mission of all of us in the aging community. It is especially a mission for my colleagues at the Age Lab. And just to give you an idea, a lot of this, this photo since we've been off campus is a bit dated in all fairness, but the fact of the matter is our team is about one third every flavor of psychology you might be able to imagine, one third engineering data science and engineering, and another third that is anthropology, social work, and the like. In fact, one of your distinguished alums is on the call right now, Taylor Pastek. I want to say thank you to her ongoing contributions and the power that she brings to the lab after getting a great education from all of you. To give you an idea in some ways as to the kind of work we do, we look across aging, not just in the biological sense, that's not where we are. We wanna rethink the physical infrastructure of what it means to be age ready. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Our major areas are looking, shall we say, at transportation. That's where we started. The old idea of an older driver, which by the way, there is no such thing. Birthdays are terrible predictors of almost anything. Health conditions are a little bit better. What is the future of the home? Is it going to be a place or a platform for services? And we have found since the pandemic that the pandemic has actually propelled technology into our lives and into the living rooms of older adults at a rate unprecedented. Caregiving, eventually you will be receiving care or giving care as Rosalind Carter once mentioned. And then also, what is the nature of this thing we call retirement? We choose to call it longevity planning. It just gives you a little bit of a background, but I want to make sure I give credit to my team for giving me the good words that I'll share with you today. So let's get going. Some of this, many of you may know, some of you may get a good chuckle, but it has implications that go well beyond research. I want you to look at these kids. Aren't they cute? You know why they're cute, don't you? They're not teenagers yet. The fact of the matter is, is that we know from pretty good research, even after the pandemic, and I know you can slice and dice parts of the population that sadly are not doing as well. But half the children in the so-called industrialized world 
are likely to live 100 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a choice right now to decide whether this is about more time in retirement or more time, a longevity dividend to be cashed in. It is not about individuals or populations aging. That's the old idea of aging and aging research. It is a time for us to rethink institutions, policies, processes, individual family responsibility and the like. Think about the following. Do you genuinely believe that getting a degree from a college or even graduate school, whatever it might be, is going to last you for 30, 40, 50, 60 years of work? Will my wife of 35 years want to hear me tell the same jokes for another 35 years? How many places will you live versus will you downsize or move someplace else only once or twice? And for any of you that think that you keep on asking our children or for those of you that have selected majors and say, what are you going to be when you grow up? We need to rethink that question. The question will be, given the changes in technology, given the velocity of new knowledge, the new question should be, how many things will you be when you grow up? Yes, longevity is changing everything. And if we look across the industrialized world, we are still seeing projections that are moving up. Sadly, longevity is the new inequity. It is not evenly distributed to poorer parts of our country, let alone to poorer nation states. In fact, my aging colleagues know that the best correlation of living longer and presumably better is not necessarily your nutrition, it's not necessarily whether you follow your doctor's orders. Heck, I grew up outside of Philadelphia. I believe it's scrappled cheesesteaks and, and, and tasty cakes or food groups. I'm not sure how well that does for my longevity. In fact, the correlation tends to be income and education. Uneven, unequitable. These are things that we need to really think about as part of our aging story as we move forward, as not just communities, but as a society writ large. Here's a number I want you to think about. The power of the aging population, so-called demographic transition, is not about simply more older people. It's about the fact that we've stopped having children. Yeah, you heard me. We've stopped having kids for all intents and purposes. The United States and most of the industrialized world have hit an all-time low birth rate. Now, this has happened before. We know due to disaster and famine and war but and pandemics, but... Right after that, we had things called the baby boom or the Dankai of Japan where population came right back up. This time it's not happening. Here's something I want you to think about. By 2047, there will be more people on the planet over age 60 than there will be so-called children under the age of 18. So for any of you that are economists, I'm sorry about that, but for any of you that are economists and are still followers of Malthus, the member of the 1700s economists that said, we were gonna eat ourselves off the planet, the carrying capacity, it's over. Didn't really think about technology, logistics, supply chain, getting food out there, new ways of doing things to feed a planet. Even the UN, who's not known for its optimism, is saying that our population is going to go up, go up, go up, and by about 2050, start going down. You need 2.1 children per female just to keep the population even. Even in those countries that are growing exponentially, their populations are going down. And like longevity itself, I bet you didn't think you'd be uh, hearing this early in the morning, the best birth control, if you will, again, is education and income. As that goes up, birth rates go down. But some countries are getting very nervous about this. One of my favorite things to look at, particularly the Europeans are looking at this, is that the population is causing great panic. Now, I wish I could get this kind of research money. Apparently in Denmark, someone financed a study that showed that Danes have more sex outside of the country than they do inside the country. So you can't believe this. So you've got to go on YouTube at some point and look up for yourself. But there's an entire advertising campaign called, ready? Can't make this up. Do it for Denmark. You see, wannabe grandparents are sending their adult children on vacation to London, Paris, New York. But please come back with a souvenir nine months later. By the way, the Danes aren't the only ones that are doing this. The Singaporeans are doing something like that. The Russians have Make a Patriot Day. And if you can demonstrate that you made said Patriot, uh, you may win a refrigerator, a discount on an apartment, or even a pickup truck. You see, population aging and birth rates are going together. And 
creating an unprecedented society around the world. In Germany, and much of the work that we do, in fact, all the work we do is sponsored by industry, but much of the work we do is sponsored by German country companies. And what's always fun about working with Germans, if they see a problem, they see a chance for innovation. And I'm speaking to a bunch of folks in St. Louis, well, the beer capital perhaps of the world, but also in Germany, they're now coming up with an anti-aging beer. But something else is going on. Not only are they aging quickly, they are emptying out. In part of parts of Munich outside of Bavaria, there are empty villages and towns and whatnot, not just because they're aging, but they're not having kids. Even with immigration, the population of Germany, the European bank, economic engine of Europe is shrinking and getting older. And China, did any of us ever expect to report that China has actually had a workforce shortage? By the way, since 2013, the one child, one family policy that was relieved a number of years ago. So far, the answer is, nah, we're not going to have any more kids. We just can't or we don't want to. But imagine this, that the median age in China and Europe and whatnot is of what essentially entire continents and countries in midlife crisis. More interestingly, is that the entire population of the United States is forecasted to be about 400 million people by the year 2050. The entire population of China, Chinese over age 60, is likely to be more than 400 million. How are they going to provide those services? What are the technologies? What are the policies that they're going to need? Old age has always been with us, but the numbers, the demand, and the, the velocity of that demographic change is unprecedented for nations and companies and indeed for families. And this is the slide that will burn into your brain for the rest of the day. You know, numbers are fun and they make great for class content, but if you want to keep someone's attention, show them an image. So yes, in Japan, they are already selling more adult diapers than they are selling child diapers. And by the way, the immigration policy of Japan also coalesces around what their future demographics are. Because as many of us like to say, demography is destiny. That economic power of Asia is going from roughly 127 million people where last year their government celebrated their population will not drop as far as they thought. It's only going to go to 89 million where more than 40% of the population will be well above retirement age. Who's going, to do the, who's going to provide the care? Who's going to manufacture the products? What is that future consumer? We could define this as a problem of aging. I hope by the end of my presentation, you realize that longevity is the greatest global success and opportunity that we must cash in today for our individuals, for our societies at large. And yes, here in the US, as many of you know, one baby boomer, that group born between 46 and 64, the Japanese call them Dankai, post-war and World War II, whatever their name might be is, they're no longer the largest generation, but there's a lot of us. And they're turning 75 every seven to eight seconds, but also they're not evenly distributed. If you look at the darker the state, the higher the concentration of older adults. And as many of you in the Midwest in particular know, the average American farmer now is 61 years old. Certain professions are just emptying out. There's no longer that, that economic diatribe of we need to get older people off the lines because there's younger people who want those jobs. Not all the jobs, petrochemical, engineering, uh, uh, energy, aerospace, farming, not a long line of young people looking for those jobs. So we're looking not just at an aging nation, but aging areas of where work and manufacturing and where care is being provided. But if you're gonna live a long time, I say we enjoy it. There's a fine line between doing everything the right way and making it feel like you're just living longer rather than enjoying it. So I say, eat your cake and perhaps more. And that's the heart of what I mean by the longevity economy and writing a new story. That there are certainly large parts of the population that fill that traditional discussion of what old age is about. There's also a large and emerging part of the population that is driving innovations in business and policy and lifestyle that are not simply going to make more years in what we currently call retirement, but more years in what we might call quality, engaged, and meaningful and purposeful life. In fact, old age is very different. 
we now have an older population and everyone behind them coming in with more education than any time in history, not just high school, but college degrees as well. Now, I'm the first to tell you, with all respect to my academic uh, colleagues, that education does not make you smart. But one thing it does give you is chronic attitude. I want you to imagine this. Nearly 64% of the 65 plus report that they believe their IQ is higher than average. Think about that mathematically for a moment. And 74% of them have a great deal of confidence in themselves. Bottom line is this group is not, shall we say, nearly as respectful of people with degrees or expertise as previous generations. Because as our millennial and Gen X and, and certainly Gen Z siblings and cousins and sons and daughters know that frankly, you could probably do your own brain surgery. You could find it on YouTube. The next generation of old is much like that. Unlike the previous generation that was patient, polite, and in many ways looking for that expertise. In fact, one of the things that we have found during COVID and my team at the Age Lab has been tracking the pandemic and its changes on attitudes and behaviors over time is that technology is still uh, suffering from a digital divide between young and old, but there's a causeway that's closing that divide. And during the pandemic, think of the number of smart speakers and iPads and every kind of device you can imagine that were thrust into our lives at all ages. In fact, Facebook is now being referred to as, you ready for this? The social media nursing home. Now, why is that? It's because the fastest growing group on there are women over the age of 50. And so if you want to terrify students, you ask them, do you have a Facebook page? And they will look at you in utter horror because they know they don't want a Facebook page because no one wants to post what they did Friday night to have their mother and their grandmother see it on Saturday morning. And video games, not just for the kids anymore. Do you know that the fastest growing group of folks adopting video games are people over 50 and within that group over 60? There's an entirely new medical category that some of your colleagues in, in occupational therapy may be aware of called we wrist and we elbow. They're playing with such verve that they're blowing out ligaments and muscles and the like, but they're keeping score. They're participating in we bowling leagues online. This is not just game, this is competition and older people are showing they wanna to win too. And as I write in my book, The Longevity Economy, the future is female. Who's gonna be the catalyst to this older population that we've never seen before? Who's going to not just make the decisions, but the information seeking and the consumption and, and guiding the medical decisions as much as the life decisions? Many of you know it, about half of you in the room know it. And that is, it's the adult daughter. If it's not the spouse or the partner, it typically becomes the oldest adult daughter. And by the way, women are already making the majority of decisions. As my wife and two daughters tell me, it was nice of me to acknowledge 51% of the population. But if you look at these data, you're looking at 89% of consumer electronics are bought by women, 65% of automobiles, except we found uh, that in luxury, that number may go up to 80, 85% of automobiles. And for those of you that are interested in health, especially those in public health and like, 80 cents and 90 cents on the dollar are decisions from your insurer to the doctor you choose, the band-aid you buy, to remind you to take the medication are decided by a woman. In fact, companies like Procter & Gamble, J&J &J and the like, pretty much have stopped doing focus groups with men. What do we buy? Maybe shaving equipment, but that's about it. And so you see the future is female because she is the one from a young age sees old age from a position of care and as we all know, is likely to live a little longer. I get a lot of rolling of eyes when I say the following. I have a real interest in middle-aged women. And I don't mean that to be cheeky. What I do mean is that if you can understand a woman between 47 and 57 years old, you understand three generations of households. As I demonstrated, she already lives in a house where probably her spouse doesn't know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But did you know that Pew Research identified that millennials say that their best friend, most trusted advice is not another millennial, but, and by the way, not their father, sadly, but their mother. That's why you see them, shall we say, shopping in pairs, not just because mom has got a credit card, but there's a trust going on. There's a, an advice. But she's also, by the way, looking in on her parents. And by the way, if her partner does not have an older adult sister, shall we say, or is not one themselves, the fact of the matter is, guess what? She is now more likely to be caring for more parents than she had ever planned on having children. 
Now, this is where he gets a little nervous for the guys. You should also know that in an aging society, that new longevity economy, we have what we call gray divorce. This is worldwide. This is not just North America. So-called gray divorce, where the number one group of folks getting divorces are people over age 50. Now, why would you give up this big hunk of man? One research study said that 90% of the divorces were initiated by... This is where the women you start laughing. Yes, by the woman. Now, was it a money problem? Could have been interesting. Was it sex? Could have been a very interesting PowerPoint slide. Nope. You ready for this? He bores me was the number one answer. And by the way, the Canadians to our north, my cousins that I have up there in Ontario and the like, I always thought they were the nicer North Americans, the more polite North Americans. They did a study up there and the Canadian women responded that the number one reason for divorce was he simply ran out of gas. Well, this guy doesn't look like he ran out of gas. He may be a dog lover, but the idea that women seem to be aging and have always seemed to age differently. They get out there more, they're doing more. In fact, entrepreneurship, one of the top groups forming new companies over age 50 are women. Entrepreneurship should be looked at as the new women's movement. And finally, longevity economy. You can't talk about economy without talking resources. Now they are inequitably distributed. There are as half the population in the United States is not prepared for retirement. But globally, if I look at the 60 plus, they are the third largest economy in the world after the GDP of China and the United States. And by the way, here in the United States, the 50 plus make up nearly 70% of the discretionary spend. Unfortunately, due to the old age story of how we think about aging, consumers only get one to 3% of the dollar for advertising for people over age 50. That's because frankly, we have a story that precludes us from thinking them as consumers rather than, shall we say, needy and greedy. Let's talk about coffee. It's still morning. It's one of my favorite topics. In fact, it's even a food group. But why would I talk about coffee? I'm sure think about coffee for a moment. Those of us who know coffee and enjoy coffee, look at the simple cup. How many of us are old enough to remember when our parents tried to tell us this was coffee? And I'm, frankly, from my position, this is not coffee. This is decaffeinated swill. But I want to show you something else that's going on. People of all ages now know this is coffee. No, it doesn't have to be something fancy or 67 different varieties of coffee where you have to speak a language of somewhere between French and Italian, whatever it might be. But I want you to understand that the generation of people that are turning 75 today and those before have grown up in a time when not only did coffee, shall we say, improve, but there were many different varieties of coffee that could be personalized to me. Do we believe for a moment as a matter of policy, as a matter of product producers and innovators, that a generation that grew up on coffee being innovative is going to simply say, you know, well, I'm old, I'm gonna stay home now. I'm gonna wait for the van that I got to book a week in advance for, or two weeks in advance for, or I'm only gonna be depending on public service if I can find them, or I'm gonna be polite and patient and hope that my grandchildren call me or visit me. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that the new generation gap of an older society is not about their age. It's not about their money alone. It's not about education. The new generation gap is about expectations. We indeed believe there will be a pill, a policy, a product, a service that will excite and delight for us to not just live longer, but to live better. You don't take a generation that had shopping malls, highways, schools, hospitals, and all the infrastructure that we now enjoy built for them as they age and suddenly say, okay, that's it. You're now old. Go home. Go wait. No, this is as much a political issue as much as it is economic, social, and equity. And finally, what that demand is, what that expectation is, that unmet need is essentially the longevity economy. That gap between what our parents accepted because they were polite, they were patient, they had a vision of old age where they were supposed to, shall we say, sit back a bit. And the next generation of old who's already here is saying, no, I want more. It's like an entire emerging market hiding in plain sight. So while investors and economists and like go looking around the world and the country, the market actually in numbers and money and demand is right here. 
So let's get to the idea of a story. You know, the oldest technology and the most powerful technology in the world, I would suggest to you, is not, shall we say, the genome or the internet or space travel. Those are all amazing things that, you know, I could hardly understand. The most powerful and oldest technology in the world, rather, is the story. The story is what helps us understand why we do certain things, why we don't do certain things, what's possible, what's not possible, what's acceptable and not acceptable. So here's what I want you to know. The story of old age, I want you to wait for it. The story of old age is made up. Yep, you heard it. No, I had my coffee this morning. I'm not talking trash, as they say. No, old age is made up. I want you to think about the following. Medical science in the 1800s in the UK, and it came to the United States and became part of our vernacular as well, believed that you were born with a certain amount of vital force or vital energy. Essentially, at birth, you were a glass that was full. But as you aged and you used that energy, you no longer became a glass that was frankly full or even half full. You became a glass that was half empty. And as you use that vital force, which by the way, meant anything fun or anything useful, you drain that energy. And what happens when you get drained of energy, this story that you, you have your energy or vital force drained from you? You become tired. See, stories not only explain certain things, but they create our language, they create institutions. We stop thinking about them. We start to think that they're like laws of gravity given by laws of physics then not only do you become tired, that you would have to then retire. You'd have to pull back. And at the time that this science was developed, remember, if you didn't have family and you did not work in the 1800s, even early 1900s, you were tired, you couldn't work. Guess what? Without family, you didn't eat either. So what happened is that the notion of retirement was that you were also poor. Alms homes slowly became, you heard me, retirement homes. And for those of us who are old enough, many of us remember the phrase funeral homes. Isn't it amazing how the story of old age being about less rather than more time, but less energy and less value translates into our language and into our institutions, and then, speaking as a social scientist, reinforces how we look at the world. That story permeates our policies, our product ideas, and the like. That story needs to change. Old age is different than it was before. The nature of work is different, society and technology. And yet our policies, our products and our society is still using the story of old age from the 1800s to think about how we want to live life tomorrow. That's a gap. In fact, part of the problem is, is if you think about it, the greatest success of humankind living longer to the tune of 30, 40 years longer than 1900 in terms of life expectancy has been defined by policymakers, pundits, and my friends, the economists, as a problem to be solved rather than an opportunity to be realized. And so we have graphics like this and studies about the horrors of what's gonna happen to our pensions and our healthcare. Well, that's only because somehow we've chosen numbers like 60 or 65 by a law of physics, that's retirement, everybody off the boat or by healthcare, that you're going to be ill at a certain age, you're going to run a broke. How many of you believe you look the same at the age you are now as the people you knew when you were kids at their same age? The old men, as I thought of them, that taught me how to fish on Lake Ontario, my uncles, guess what? I thought they were really old and whatnot. I did the math one day. When they were showing me how to fish, they were only in their 40s. I think 40s looks a little different today, as does 60s, 70s, and 80s and beyond. Stories have consequences though. Industry takes these stories and even with money and intelligence and big data have stupid ideas. Heinz came up with the notion of Heinz senior foods because apparently old people don't have taste, they don't have teeth, it doesn't matter. So they took baby product and they changed it for older adults. Needless to say that crashed and burned. The vision most of us have right now of retirement and old age is either illness or playtime. There's gotta be a lot of life in between those two bookends. Del Webb in the 1950s created the notion of, gee, I got a lot of people who are retiring. They're in decent health. They've got pensions. What are we gonna do with them? Oh, I know, they can play. The notion that retirement was about leisure. And by the way, that retirement would start early. So you've got years of leisure. Not incorrect perhaps, but woefully incomplete. 
We see products out there that are all about things that we want our older adult loved ones to wear that say, old man walking. Think about this. Only 35% of people over 75 in a survey indicate that they feel old. But 100% of people that have got a bracelet on them that say that I'm an old man about to fall down, know that they're old. And by the way, the penetration rate of devices like personal emergency response systems, very rational, very appropriate for many. By the way, the penetration rate, even for those who need them, is less than four percent. And I know what you're going to say. Well, it's about the money, Joe. All right. In the United Kingdom, where they're paid for 100%, penetration of the 65 frail population only goes up to 11%. How about senior housing? This is before COVID. Even before COVID, we saw senior housing, as it is thought of and marketed today, is not getting the drive that it should. In fact, the people that are investing in this product category are looking at the numbers, but they're not looking at the behavior and the, deci and the decision-making values of the people. How about this? When we look at the engineers that come to our lab and you know, we're based in the School of Engineering and whatnot, is this, a, is this a, a remote control or is it a self-defense device? Somehow designers and engineers have to be a little bit more courageous and innovative to make something that is ageless and useful for all of us, not something that is inherently insulting. How about this? One of the things you'll see in so-called age tech is that it seems to revolve around our health because somewhere along the line, the story of old age says, everything you're going to do after age 50 or 60 or definitely after 65 is check your blood pressure and remind you to take your medications. No, old age is an opportunity. It's an entire life stage. What's this color? No, it's not your screen going bad. No, this is, this is a color that is often used in almost anything that has to do with older adults. Well, well, that's not fair. Some companies believe they've gotten truly innovative. In fact, they're using this color. I call this medical or clinical blue. Does anyone want a product that looks like these things or these colors anywhere in their home? No, the story of old age has almost made us embarrassed to be older, but I guarantee, like the auto industry uh, adage goes, you cannot make a product for an old man or an older woman. Why? Because they will run with their hair on fire or at least some of us will have our hair on fire. But guess what? A younger man, an older woman won't buy them. So basically the products lay fallow and are no longer usable by anyone. Let me tell you a little bit about this thing we're calling retirement today. I'm gonna to do some basic math and with a little, shall we say, uh, uh, a fudge factor on, on the numbers. I want you to follow me on this. Do you know from zero to 21 years old is about 8,000 days? And by the way, if it makes it easier for some of you, birth to drinking age is about 8,000 days. And then from 21 years old to what many of us might call midlife crisis, at least today, 46, 47 and thereabouts is about another 8,000 days. Now, I bet the quant jocks out there are starting to get the algorithm. From midlife crisis to retirement age, 65, remember that law of nature, 65 retirement age is about 8,000 days. But imagine this. More than 50% of the population will live over age 85. And guess what that is? That's another 8,000 days. Ladies and gentlemen, if I take zero to 21, we'll just call that childhood or emerging adulthood, and we'll push that off to the side. We are no longer thinking of old age or retirement in the classic sense. We are now envisioning one third of adult life. Where are the rituals, the myths, the stories, the products and the policies that enliven one third of your adult life rather than looking at it as a problem? In fact, retirement may have many different phases. It may be about managing ambiguity. Some may be retiring to change jobs. Some may be retiring to drive for Uber. Some may be volunteering with Verve or caring for grandchildren, but they're still working. Are they retired? Not in the classic sense. Then there's managing big decisions. I'll show my age. I'm a fan of the, the rock group, The Clash. Remember the line they had? Should I stay or should I go? Do I downsize? Do I finally stop work? What do I do? And then there's the biggest lie of them all in retirement. Time to take it easy. No big decisions. No, it's a time of managing complexity, managing medication, nutrition needs, caregiving. Is where I'm living now truly supportive of what I'm going to need tomorrow? And that fourth stage, no, not the existential stage, I'll let you all take care of that, but the idea that at least one of us, usually a woman, is going to be living solo for a number of years. How do we manage that complexity as well? 
And when we start thinking about old age, we're finding that more and more people want to work, not just because of the money, that's a huge part of it. But for others, it's about meaning. And the fact that we learned during the pandemic, we spend more time with our folks at work than we do with our own families. So work is one of those things that's about our identity, our purpose, having a reason to get up in the morning. We find during COVID that many of us are able to broadcast live from our basement. Now, this is not something that everyone can do by any stretch of the imagination. But our research at the Age Lab indicates that some people are really starting to rethink this idea of retirement. Well, maybe if I don't have to work 40 hours a week and maybe I can do flex time, maybe I'll stick around a little bit longer. And we're living in a world where school is never out. Yes, the high school kids and the middle school and grammar school kids don't like Zoom. And many of the grad students and undergrads may not like it, but we have now found it possible. The idea of having education for a lifetime to remain vital and vibrant and refreshed. How about caring for ourselves? You know, one of the things that we like to do in statistics and in public health is we talk about how terribly ill the population is. Indeed, we are. We have chronic conditions. But that's really bad counting because you may have a chronic condition. You may have two or three of them, but particularly at age 60. But are you sick? Are you not able to walk the dog, garden, see a grandchild, work part time, clean the house? That's the definition between ill and sick. And the technologies that we've seen thrust in the home that have been around for 100 years, such as telemedicine, are now being making it possible for a checkup a day or a refresher a day to make sure that people are taking their meds, eating well, staying hydrated and the like. We're seeing the home transformed. Even the poorest of homes, as they buy new things to come in the home, are becoming connected. Your refrigerator's talking to your toaster. Your toaster's talking to your oven. And by the way, talking to strangers outside the home, whether it's the grocery store or the drugstore. Samsung is now predicting that in a few short years, the average home will have 500 so-called smart devices, the internet of things. We're seeing devices already in the market, both out of pocket and insured, to remind you to take your meds, to give you, to, to provide, shall we say, high tech company. I'm not saying these are a substitute, but I am saying they are profoundly changing how we age. How about where are you going to live? You know, one of the things we don't talk about enough in old age is not just about illness and sickness, and whatever, but where are you going to live? 70% of the population in the United States over the age of 50 lives in suburban and rural areas. My background's originally in transportation. There is no public transportation, generally speaking, or it serves poorly where most older adults live. We are coming up on a mobility gap overall. Most of us want to age in place, essentially where your marriage, your mortgage, your memories are. We want to stay there. Problem is, is half the people who say they want to stay in their home, are not sure they're gonna be able to do so. Yes, there's about eight livable communities and age-friendly communities. I wanna change the vernacular. I don't want an age-friendly community. I want an age-ready community. I don't want it to be polite that I'm modifying the community for older adults to remain accessible and mobile and, and purposeful. They've been living here for their entire lives, contributing taxes and, and everything else. We need to make our communities age-less and age-ready. Age-friendly has a lower sense of urgency, a lower political par uh, uh, sense of urgency. We need to make it a priority for all of us. Who's going to change your light bulbs? I bet you never think of that question as part of aging and aging well. But who are you going to have come in your home at an older age or your loved one's home to change their light bulbs? How much is it going to cost? Who's that service going to be? Remember, the birth rate declined. You don't have that adult daughter or she may have moved or maybe she's busy. Who's that new service provider to clean the house, take out the trash, prepare meals, whatever it might be. As we found during the pandemic, now new services are emerging. Some are affordable, some are not. Some can be trusted, some less so. Here's my favorite question because ice cream is a food group. How are you gonna get an ice cream cone as a metric of quality aging? I'm not being funny. You know, we often think about in retirement, what are your objectives in retirement? Not the big things, you know, maybe a trip to Disney or a cruise ship and a free bout of norovirus. No, not those. I'm talking about, do you know the little things that make you smile every day? And do you have access to them at the moment you want them? It's a hot summer night. You want a soft serve ice cream cone. Are you nearby? Can you get there? Do you drive? Will somebody take you? That's the measure of quality of where you live as much as knowing what it is you want. Driving remains the glue that holds life together in the United States. Before you do anything, you've got to get there first. The number one way older adults get around is driving. The second way is riding with someone who drives, then walking, then public transit. 
and that driverless car. We're doing a lot of work in the lab. My team led by Brian Reamer doing great work. Don't get excited. The car may be coming soon, but I want to ask you, how are you going to get from your couch into the car? And then by the way, at the other end, out of the car to where you're going. Your mom is 80 some years old. She has cognitive decline. She's not feeling well. The driverless car may get the road trip done, but not the first and last 25 feet. We're still seeing real need for human touch, even with that high tech. Our team has created Agnes, the age gain now empathy system, which you can see on fast forward a TV documentary on PBS, looking at transit. Just because transit may be Americans with Disabilities Act compliant does not necessarily mean it's truly accessible from signage to covering to temperature to the crowds and whatnot, being able to navigate and in, 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 in wayfare where you are. Very different for all of us at older ages. As I bring this to a close, some other questions you want to think about as we rewrite the story of old age, as we rethink what it's going to be. Who are you going to have lunch with? No, you know, sounds silly. But you know, when you retire on Friday, everyone goes, gee, Joe, thanks so much. Congratulations on your retirement. We'll have to get together for lunch. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, month comes, year comes, third year comes, no lunch. Your social security, the real social security, not that provided by government, is starting to bank the human capital you will need as you age. And as one woman said to me in a focus group, son, which I enjoyed being called son at that point, Son, there's a natural attrition to friendship over age. And we know that social isolation is the equivalent, physical equivalent of smoking 11 to 15 cigarettes per day. Social isolation is a crisis, not just in the suburbs, as many would predict. In fact, in rural areas, social isolation in many ways is less than it is in the city. Just because you're on the same floor, on the 10th floor, does not mean you have social connectivity. We're finding certain devices, whether it's the Wii games or devices we developed in the lab, can actually connect people with high tech, with a fun and a laugh. But high tech is no replacement for high touch. We find that robots are now coming into our lives, expensive for many, but they will be affordable soon to remind you to take your meds, food. And in fact, some robots like Pepper will insult you twice a day. Apparently, that's one way of maintaining your cognitive function. I have teenage daughters. I get inside, insulted for free. I don't need to buy a robot for that. And then lastly, who's gonna provide care? How do we have a population where we have fewer children or children that have moved away to provide care for loved ones and ourselves as we age in the suburbs, rural or wherever that might be? That growing demand for services. Think about the demographic reality of a coming caregiver gap. Single person households are on the rise. Single person households due to people moving out or divorce. Double income, no kids used to be a punchline. Now it's a point in older age. Distance adults and caregivers are gonna be hard pressed to provide care. We're seeing robots fill that gap, if you will, in Japan and Europe and now coming to the United States in senior housing and in the homes we live in today. And my favorite example, smart toilets. Now I know it's very close to lunch at this point, so I'll keep it clean. I want you to imagine Toto, Panasonic are starting to provide toilets that shall we say, best way to put it, computer science vernacular, download from the user. Did you take your meds today? Are you eating well? Are you hydrated? What's your blood pressure? And then upload those data to a call center, nutritionist, doctor, whatever it is. This isn't blue sky MIT craziness. These are already on the market. And by the way, in multiple countries. But you know, high tech, even though despite my address, is not a substitute for high touch. But let me leave you on the following point. We need to not just think about writing a new story for old age. It's not just about the technologies we can invent and the services we can innovate. We have an obligation in that endless frontier of longevity to think about the accessibility. Where do people find these things? You know, how do they know about them? Can they be used? The affordability, the inequity, of having some that will age well and some that's less so. And by the way, the acceptability, just because I can monitor, manage and motivate everything you do in your home from your toilet to your toaster, doesn't necessarily mean you want me to, even if I do it in the name of safety. My last word to you, I have a strange interest in architecture particularly history of architecture. And I tripped over a book now, uh, many years ago on building cathedrals in Europe. They didn't really make any sense at the time they were being built. They were not just acts of faith, but frankly, they were so big, so grand, they didn't have the population to fill them up. What was the purpose of this? 
And the architects argue, and the history argues the following, that architects, budding engineers, mathematicians, and yes, politicians, and, and the church wanted to see how far could they build the church or these structures? How could they push their practice, their knowledge, their expertise to rise to the heavens with great statements of architecture in cathedrals? Ladies and gentlemen, and I'm looking at all of you right straight in the camera. This is not just about research. This is not just about policy and service delivery. We have a new opportunity in front of us to live longer and better. Your charge, your challenge is to write a new story of how we can bring aging from a problem into an amazing cathedral of opportunity in the future. A new endless frontier powered by people, technology, and passion. On that note, I want to thank all of you for having me. It's been a real delight. I hope to see you virtually, but more importantly, I hope to see you in person sometime soon. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.